Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. So yesterday, Wednesday, uh, was Hidden Figures Day. But yesterday was that fake-ass holiday. Um, and my neighbors started setting off fireworks, like, Tuesday night. And they literally fucking let off fireworks all day and night yesterday. So I could not record, because it was extremely, extremely, extremely loud. Like, boom, boom, boom. So I had to record this video today, <laughs> Thursday, uh, and in honor of yesterday, a uh, fake-ass holiday, uh, Fireworks Day, as I've seen people calling it, I've refused to call it Independence Day, Freedom Day, or anything like that for the fact that, you know, white people won their freedom from Britain, and then, you know, slavery went on for practically another uh, 100 years, but, you know, that's neither here nor there. I want us to do Faith Ringgold. Faith Ringgold for today's hidden figure, who is uh, an artist, a little known artist. Well, if you're into art, you might know who she is, but she's not like super duper duper famous. Um, you know, she's not like the Martin Luther King of the art world or anything like that, even though she has done substantial work uh, in terms of, um, I guess you could call it civil rights or, you know, civic justice uh, and art, art and activism. Um, so Faith Ringgold was born the youngest of three children on October 8th, 1930 in Harlem Hospital, New York City. Her parents, Andrew Lewis Jones and Willie Posey Jones, descended from working class families displaced by the Great Migration, and her mother was a fashion designer and her father was an avid storyteller. Ringgold was raised in an environment that encouraged her creativity, and after the Harlem Renaissance, her childhood home in Harlem was left with a vibrant and thriving art scene. Figures such as Duke Ellington and Langston Hughes lived just around the corner from her home, and her childhood friend, Sonny Rollins, who would later become a prominent jazz musician, often visited her family and practiced his saxophone at their parties. Because of her chronic asthma, Ringgold explored visual art as a major pastime through the support of her mother, often experimenting with crayons as a young girl. In a statement she later made about her youth, she said, I grew up in Harlem during the Great Depression. This did not mean I was poor and oppressed. We were protected from oppression and surrounded by a loving family. I just want to say that I love that. Whenever people watch my video on fucking fake-ass integration and find out that I'm a separatist, they always say, like, well, so you want to, like, go back to the time when white people were killing black people in the streets and oppressing them? And I'm like, well, for one, that time never ended. For two, yeah, I would like to be back in, in fucking uh, self-sustaining black autonomous communities if I'm going to have to fucking deal with white people regardless. But that's neither here nor there. With all of these influences combined, Ringgold's future artwork was greatly affected by the people, poetry, and music she experienced in her childhood, as well as the racism, sexism, and segregation that she dealt with in her everyday life. In 1950, due to pressure from her family, Ringgold enrolled in the City College of New York to major in art, but was forced to major in art education instead because City College only allowed women to be enrolled in certain majors. The same year, she also married a jazz pianist named Robert Earl Wallace, and had two children. However, because of his heroin addiction, they separated four years later and he later died. Ringgold began her painting career in the 1950s after receiving her degree. She took inspiration from the writings of James Baldwin and Amiri Baraka, African art impressionism and cubism to create the works that she made in the 1960s. Her early work is composed with flat figures and shapes, and though she received a great deal of attention for these images, galleries and collectors were uncomfortable with them and she sold very little work. This is because many of her paintings focused on the underlying racism in everyday activities. These works were also politically based and reflected her experiences growing up during the Harlem Renaissance. These themes later grew into maturity during the civil rights movement and the women's movements. So this woman was just like far, 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 far ahead of her time in terms of creating political art, essentially. In 1955, Ringgold received her bachelor's degree from City College and soon afterward taught in the New York City public school system. In 1959, she received her master's degree from City College and left with her mother and daughters on her first trip to Europe. While traveling abroad in Paris, Florence, and Rome, Ringgold visited many museums, including the Louvre. There are going to be some words that I cannot pronounce. Let me tell you guys now, you guys know I can't pronounce shit. This museum in particular inspired her future series of quilt paintings, which she's most known for, these these quilt, these quilts that she did that uh, depicted race and, and black American life and politics in, in this um, 
really interesting medium of quilting. And I actually have a friend that also does uh, really interesting stuff with quilting as well. So that was actually how I heard of this artist. Uh, this trip was, this museum in particular inspired her feature series of quilt paintings known as the French Collection. This trip was abruptly cut short, however, due to the untimely death of her brother in 1961. Faith Ringgold, her mother, and her daughters all returned to the U.S. for his funeral, and she later would meet and marry her second husband, Burdette Ringgold, in the U.S. on May 19, 1962. Taking inspiration from artist Jacob Lawrence and writer James Baldwin, Ringgold painted her first political collection named the American People Series in 1963. It portrays the American lifestyle and reaction to the civil rights movement and illustrates these racial interactions from a woman's point of view. This collection asks the question why about some basic racial issues in American society and oil paintings like four members only neighbors watching and waiting and the civil rights triangle also embody these themes and you can imagine with titles like neighbors for members only and watching and waiting with some of these paintings depicted right in 1972 as part of a commission sponsored by the creative artists public service program Ringgold installed for the women's house in the women's facility on Rikers Island the large-scale mural is composed of depictions of women in professional and civil servant roles representing positive alternatives to incarceration the women portrayed are inspired by extensive interviews that Ringgold conducted with women inmates and the design divides the portraits into to triangular sections referencing the Cuba or Cuba textiles of the Congo. It was her first public commission and is widely regarded as her first feminist work. Around the opening of her show for American People, Ringgold also worked on her collection called America Black, also called the Black Light series, in which she experimented with darker colors. This was spurred by her observation that white Western art was focused around the color white and light contrast, while African cultures in general used darker colors and emphasized color rather than tonality to create contrast. Because of this, she was in pursuit of a more affirmative black aesthetic. She also created larger than life murals, such as The Flag is Bleeding, US postage stamp commemorating the advent of black power people, and die, concluding her American People series. These murals helped her approach her future artwork in a new way. Ringgold went to Europe in the summer of 1972 with her daughter Michelle, and while she was there, she continued into Germany and the Netherlands. I cannot pronounce this. In Amsterdam, she visited the Rijks, it is spelled R-I-J-K-S, Rijks Museum? Rijk? I'm going to go with Ricks. She visited the Ricks Museum, which became one of the most influential experiences affecting her mature work and subsequently led to the development of her quilt paintings. In the museum, Ringgold encountered a collection of 14th and 15th century Nepali paintings that were framed with cloth brocades. These inspired her to create fabric borders around her own work, so when she returned to the U.S., a new painting series was born, the Slave Rape Series. In these works, Ringgold imagined what it must have been like to be a woman captured and sold into slavery. She invited her mother, Willie Posey, to collaborate on the, on the project and sit for it. This collaboration eventually led to the making of their first quilt together, Echoes of Harlem, in 1980, which was done in the African-American quilting tradition. She quilted her stories in order to be heard, since at the time, no one would publish her autobiography. Her first quilt story, Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima, depicts the story of Aunt Jemima as a matriarch restaurateur. Another piece titled Change, Faith Ringgold's over 100 pound weight loss performance story engages the topic of a woman who wants to feel good about herself, struggling to the cultural norms of beauty. A person whose intelligence and political sensitivity allows her to see the inherent contradictions in her position as an artist and someone who gets inspired to take the whole dilemma into her artwork. The series of story quilts from Ringgold's French collection deals with historical African-American women who dedicated themselves to change the world, the redirection of the male gaze, and the immersion of historical fantasy and childlike imaginative storytelling. Many of her quilts went on to inspire the children's books that she later made, because in the uh, later part of her career, she began writing children's books, such as Dinner at Aunt Connie's House, published in 1993. In 1973, 
Ringgold began experimenting with sculpture. This woman was in every medium. In 1973, Ringgold began experimenting with sculpture as a new medium to document her local community and national events. Her sculptures range from costume masks to hanging and freestanding soft sculptures, representing both real and fictional characters from her past and present. She began making mixed media costume masks after hearing her students express their surprise that she did not already include masks in her artistic practice. The masks were pieces of linen canvas that were painted, beaded, and woven, woven excuse me, and rectangular pieces of cloth for dresses with painted gourds to represent breasts. She eventually made a series of 11 mask costumes called the Witch Mask Series. These costumes could also be worn, but would give the wearer feminine features like breasts, bellies, and hips. In the series, she wanted the masks to have both a spiritual and sculptural identity, emphasizing the fact that the masks could be worn and were not merely objects to be hung and displayed. After the Witch Mask series, she moved on to another series of 31 masks, the Family of Woman Mask series in 1973, which commemorated women and children whom she had known as a child. As many of Ringgold's mask sculptures could also be worn as costumes, her transition from mask making to performance art was a self-described natural progression. Her first piece involving these masks was The Wake and Resurrection of the Bicentennial Negro, which she described as a narrative of the dynamics of racism and the oppression of drug addiction in response to the American Bicentennial celebrations of 1976. She wished to voice the opinion of many other Black Americans that there was no reason to celebrate 200 years of American independence for almost half of that time we had been in slavery, which is exactly why I wanted to use her for Hidden Figures today. The piece was performed in mime with music and lasted 30 minutes and incorporated many of her past paintings, sculptures, and installations. She later moved on to produce many other performance pieces, including a solo, excuse me, a solo autobiographical performance piece called Being My Own Woman, an autobiographical masked story. Many of these performances were also interactive as Ringgold encouraged her audience to sing and dance with her. She describes in her autobiography, which was later published, we flew, and called We Flew Over the Bridge, that her performance pieces were not meant to shock, confuse, or anger, but rather simply another way to tell my story. And I feel like that was pretty important to mention because we've talked about other artists like uh, Donald Glover and Kanye West and um, um, Jordan Peele and, and this idea of uh, performance art or political art or art as activism as something that's meant to shock us, as something that's meant to be just extremely graphic and explicit and shocking. But she said her performance pieces were not meant to shock, confuse, or anger, but rather simply another way to tell her story, which I think is really, really um, pertinent and relevant right now. Ringgold has written and illustrated 17 children's books. Her first was Tar Beach, published in 1991 and based on her quilt story of the same name. And for that work, she won the Ezra Jack Keats New Writer Award and the Coretta Scott King Award for illustration. She was also the runner-up for the Caldecott Medal, the, the premier American Library Association Award for picture books in illustration. In her picture books, Ringgold approaches complex issues of racism in straightforward and hopeful ways, combining fantasy and realism to create an uplifting message for children. Ringgold has also been a political activist since the 1970s, participating in several feminist and anti-racist organizations. In 1968, fellow artist Poppy Johnson and art critic Lucy Lippard founded the Ad Hoc Women's Art Committee with Ringgold and protested a major modernist art exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Not only were women artists excluded from this show, but no African American artists were represented either. Even Jacob Lawrence, an artist in the museum's permanent collection, was excluded. It was just white men only, just white men, just no coloreds allowed, no women allowed. After participating in more protest activity, Ringgold was arrested on November 13, 1970. Ringgold and Lippert also worked together during their partici participation, excuse me, in the group Women Artists in Revolution, or war. That same year, Ringgold and her daughter Michelle Wallace founded Women Students and Artists for Black Art Liberation. Around 1974, Ringgold and Wallace were founding members of the National Black Feminist Organization, and Ringgold was also a founding mem member of the Where We At Black Women Artists, a New York-based women's art collective associated with the Black art movement. 
In a statement about black representation in the arts, she said, When I was in elementary school, I used to see reproductions of Horace Pippin's 1942 painting called John Brown Going to His Hanging in my textbooks. I didn't know Pippin was a black person. No one ever told me that. I was much, much older before I found out that there was at least one black artist in my history books. Only one. Now that didn't help me. That wasn't good enough for me. How come I didn't have that source of power? It is important. That is why I'm a black artist. It is exactly why I say who I am. In 1988, Ringwald co-founded the Coast to Coast National Women Artists of Color Project with Clarissa Slig. From 1988 to 1996, this organization exhibited the works of African American women across the United States. In 1995, Ringgold published her first autobiography titled We Flew Over the Bridge. The book is a memoir detailing her journey as an artist and life events, from her childhood in Harlem and Sugar Hill, to her marriages and children, to her professional career and accomplishments as an artist. Two years later, she received two honorary doctorates, one for education from Wheelock College in Boston and the second for philosophy from Molloy College in New York. Ringgold resides with her second husband, Burdette Birdie Ringgold, in a home in Inglewood, New Jersey, where she has lived and maintained a steady studio practice since 1992. And obviously there were lots of quotes sprinkled in there for you guys. Uh, there will be links and more information in the description box. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I know it was a little bit longer, but this woman did a lot. Faith Ringgold, a hidden figure. Hopefully you guys are having a great week. See you guys next time. Peace.